Over many years, I, along with working with the CSF and the CNS and everything else, quite phenomenal. And actually, before I start, can you just have a show of hands who's actually done the rule of the R3 court? So I get an idea of who I'm talking to. Two, okay. <laughs> That's fine. So over the years, I've had always a strong interest in, in the heart and I remember once going to the Southern Society meetings many, many years ago after playing around with palpating the heart with a stethoscope under my hat as I was palpating, which was quite fun because you could actually hear the changes, what happened by the sound during the treatment process. And it would have been, what, three or four years ago now, we had our first rule of the archery course in the UK. Well, we invited Maxwell Frabau and Anthony Norrie and Michael Solano to come along and, and run the courses. And on the very first practical, we were asked to palpate the popliteal fossa, the sort of popliteal artery. So I put my hand under the knees, was like a good boy that I am. I feel this. Oh, this is interesting. And he says, no, no, just not feel the artery, feel inside the artery. I thought, oh, okay. Wow, this is interesting. And then he said, well, look, can you feel a little bit lower down to the, towards the feet? Well, this is interesting too. And then he said, well, look, what happens if you go the other way, up towards the aorta? So I thought, about this aorta. It's great having the, the arteries, it's great as something you can imagine you could feel from the outside. But he was actually asking me to feel it from inside the, the, inside the tube. Now I thought, well, in for a penny, in for a pound. As much as the rebel within me that always tries to go one stage different. And I thought, well, how far can I go? All I can say, I was nearly fell off my chair because I had a perception of plaque inside the student I was working on, on the arch of his aorta. I thought, sure, this is a good course. <coughs> and then later on, we were doing some things with the pulmonary arteries, and we had to sort of get a sense of the the outflow from the right side of the heart. And we had to get a sense of feeling these blood vessels, the, the pulmonary arteries. And again, the rebel with me thought, well, what happens if you just go beyond what you're supposed to do and feel that big as far as you can go? I thought, I'm supposed to go a bit further and go a bit further and go a bit further. And after a while of going beyond what I thought was outside their body almost, I got this sense of fizzing. I thought, well, shit, I'm actually feeling the alveoli. And I thought, no, that's don't be stupid, you can't be, you must be imagining that. So I sort of came back you know, a centimeter of my awareness, and it went, nothing, nothing there. So I sort of went back, back without further again. And this, like a bubbling feeling. And I thought, blimey, this isn't really good. So I had to work with Jeremy, who I was working with at that time. And I said, Jeremy, look, if you do this, what do you feel? I don't know, he said, well, we'll have a go. So he went like this. And I thought, well, if this, you know, I'm actually up. If you've got two people feeling the same thing, and you don't tell them what you're feeling, it's some sort of, you're either both imagining the same thing purely by chance, or there's something genuinely in it. So by that time, I was a bit hooked. And the following year, I decided to fly all the way down to Australia for three days, and then come straight back again because the course was going on again. Now, when we look at our patients, we do our diagnosis and our treatments. We do our osteopathic training and we follow our osteopathic sphere and we look at the musculoskeletal system and we look at the nervous system. And we make our evaluation based on all our different findings. And a lot of our model is very much nervous system based. And we look at the, the joints and the muscles, and then we think, oh yes, this is supplied by C234 or L5 or whatever. And that's very much part and package of our diagnostic awareness. And then our treatment, when we're working on it, we're thinking about 
you know, can we take the pressure off the nerves? Can we sort of um, defacilitate them, get rid of the nervous facilitation? And you know, if you've got some disc problems, you work on the disc, we have any awareness to take that into a virtual foramina and just take the pressure off the nerves. These are very much in the forefront of our thinking when we treat our patients. And this enables us to have a very significantly beneficial effect on helping the neuromusculoskeletal system. And we do it all the time in our practices. But how much time do we stop to think, hang on, what about the blood supply? Do you think of the blood supply to the disc? Do you think of the blood supply to the joints? Do you think of the blood supply to the kidneys that is purifying the blood, which is going to affect the quality of the toxicity in the body? So let's just talk about some interesting <coughs> facts about the heart and the circulation. As I say, some of the things I'm going to be talking about today are taken from the Rule of the Artery course, and some of the things I've sort of developed over the years and discovered much more for myself. So these are some things that Maxwell found out and has passed on. If we were laid the blood vessels throughout that are in the body end to end, they'd be about 100,000 kilometers in length, two and a half times around the whole planet, and 80% of that would be capillaries. About 7,500 liters of blood would travel throughout your body in a day. And during the course of your lifetime, assuming you don't have an early death, you've got around two and a half billion heartbeats from your heart. One droplet of blood contains about 250 molecules of hemoglobin. And this one really, really got to me. The heart is 5,000 times more electrical than the brain. 5,000 times more electrical than the CNS. Electrocardiographs were developed about 20 years before electroencephalographs because the electrical signal is so much more powerful, they had to have far more refined technology to detect the brain waves compared to the powerful waves coming into the heart. So, if you do the cranial approach, you can put your hands on and you can feel that sort of electrical feel from the central nervous system. Well, the heart is 5,000 times more powerful. How much of that is affecting the whole physiology? It's got to be radiating outside of the physiology because it's so powerful. If you have an electrical field, that's 5,000 times stronger than the brain. Just sleep on that for a few nights. About 60% of our blood is inactive, and it's just a blood reserve. Now, the ancient Egyptians, in their wisdom, they thought the heart was the source of the emotions. And I don't know how it's considered today by cardiologists, but even fairly recently, this has been still dismissed. There was BBC did a wonderful um, Horizon program a few years ago when people had had heart transplants and talking to the recipients. And talking to the recipients how often they had acquired knowledge and hobbies and interests, in some cases, of the donor. There was one case. So this guy was a, had been a doctor in Liverpool most of his life. And, as I say, he was a lovely guy, but he wasn't the, the sharpest brain in the, in the book, as they say. And he had a heart transplant. His wife was totally dumbfounded when he, within literally about 10 days of having his heart transplant coming out of the hospital, he suddenly developed a fantastic interest in poetry. <laughs> Guess what the profession of the donor was? Poet. A lot of cardiologists when you mention these sort of things, they say, well, this is no coincidence. Well, I don't think those sort of 
situations can be pure coincidence because the recipient doesn't know the donor and especially didn't know that he was a poet and would take up an interest in poetry afterwards. The heart, as we know, creates a sound, lup, duck, lup, duck, lup, duck. And that sound is being conveyed as a sound wave down the blood vessels to the rest of the body. And the beating of that heart is sending sound waves to every cell in, every cell in your body. Now, we all know that blood is a thicker density than water and water is a thicker density than air. So, as we know, the sound travels further in the water under the sea than it does in air, and blood would transmit it better than that. So blood is a very, very powerful ability and medium for transmitting sound. So the heart is literally talking to every cell in your body. All over the world, if you want somebody to be quiet, all over the world, and nobody's ever told any other country what to do, you will say, shh. And you put your finger to your, to your mouth and go, shh. Well, the sound, shh, is the sound heart makes and blood makes going through your blood vessels. When a baby is not very, it's unsettled, all over the world, nobody's ever told them, you pat the baby's back about like this and go shh. The shh is making the sound of the heart that the baby hears in the womb, and you pat about this rate, which is replicating the mother's heartbeat. <coughs> it's instinctive within us. You don't have to tell a parent to do this, they know. We all do it. There's a place in California called the Heart Math Institute. And they've done a lot of interesting research on the heart and its relationship to the brain. And they did a research where they had somebody sitting in front of a computer screen, wired up to an electrocardiograph and an electroencephalograph. And they put two, they got an independent computer expert to get a load of pictures, some of which were beautiful sunsets, waterfalls, things that babies, animals that go, ah, to your, to your thinking. And other ones, which would be war, spiders, snakes, things that make you go a bit like this. And they randomised these pictures on the computer, and then got the person who was wired up to the EEG and ECG to look at the images on the screen as they came up, to measure the response. They found that the heart responded before the brain did. And they found that both responded before the image hit the screen. It's rather interesting. And they're now finding that the heart is actually, it's got a series of um, nerve plexi that feed back to the brain and respond before the brain does. So in some circles, it's now considering the heart is the brain's brain. So it's a higher center than the brain for some neuronal activity. We know that without our circulation we die. When we get a poor function, you get relative degrees of death, of lack of ability, undernourishment of the cells, poor oxygenation and toxicity. And how many times have you taken the case history from somebody and the way they respond you do your examination, and you palpate their tissues, and the whole thing just feels yuck and sluggish. And if you, you do this cranial type approach, you put your hands on the central nervous system, and you can feel as if the charge and the battery is like almost dead. Anybody had this experience? Yeah? Remember, the heart's 5,000 times more electric than the brain. And if the brain is low capacity, could it be also, or even perhaps more so, that the heart output of electrical charge is less? We just look at signs of poor circulation. We've got leg ulcers, we know about that. 
you're going to get swelling and edema, you're going to get discoloration of the skin, cyanosis, poor venous quality, you get varicose stains, you can get hair loss, weakness of the nails, and the skin can get dry and itchy. The nails tend to get weaker and they can break and fall apart more easily. People can get digestive problems. These are the first lot were outward signs, but the ones that you can't see visibly, you're going to get lack of good digestion, because less blood flowing into the digestive tract, into the liver, which is going to get, suppress the appetite. Your immune system is going to become less efficient. The patient's going to get cold hands, cold feet. They're going to feel more tired. There's going to be some erectile dysfunction in the, in the mouth elements. Had angina. All these things have been talked out about very, very clearly this weekend. And the reason this space is on these slides, because I've just deleted it because there's no point in my talking about it. We've heard it so much this weekend. <coughs> poor cognitive function, numbness in the fingers, lack of appetite. Now, we all know that 80-90% of our patients that we see tend to come with spinal problems. This is a major problem that we wish the population at large knew that osteopathy could help many, many other things, but unfortunately, this is the state of the profession and the public awareness at the moment. And we know that about 30-40% 30 of adults over 40 years have disc degeneration. This is the bread and butter of our practices, we know that. But we need to consider the state of the vasculature to the spine in addition to all the things that we do in our normal osteopathic awareness. So here we've got a picture of the aorta and these are the segmental arteries coming off to supply the discs, the joints, the postural muscles, the spinal cord. This is what gets your goodies into your spine at the segmental level. It's in your hand now. Now, poets, authors, people who work very much on an artistic level, artists, musicians, talk about the heartstrings and the pulling of the heartstrings. Now, here's your aorta. We know that the diameter of the aorta is about this size. The wall of it is probably about just a little bit less thick than my little finger, probably about half the thickness of my finger. How strong a mechanical pipe is that? It's a pipe with a strong muscular wall, so it's a strong mechanical structure in its own right. It's under blood pressure. So it's a pressurized, powerful, strong pipe. How often do you consider the fluid dynamics of that pressurized muscular pipe as having a mechanical effect on the body posture? And what's going to happen if the heart tightens up and pulls on these heart strings? The aorta, blood vessels into the, into the, the carotid arteries. What happens if they're tight and get pulled? What happens if this heart goes <coughs> What happens to your posture if it goes <coughs> Yeah? Somebody yesterday, was it Audrey, was saying how people tend to go forwards as they get older. <coughs> yeah? You remember saying that? Well, what happens if the heart pulls on this giant heart string, the aorta, and shortens it. It's going to go... Yeah? And there's going to be a slight pulling on the... the dominance of the... carotid arteries, and the brachiocephalic arteries. And what's that going to do to the CT? It's going to go... as, it, as these strings are going to pull your head closer to your heart, and it goes... At the same time, the aorta is going like this, 
and you end up with a posture a bit like this. A bit familiar to all of us. So do realize that blood vessels, particularly arteries, have a powerful mechanical effect on the physiology, on the biomechanics, on the posture, with nothing to do with what they're delivering in terms of the blood, just the effect of those vessels in themselves having a mechanical effect. Now, if we look at the segmental arteries, here's the aorta giving off these segmental arteries all the way down the spine. And that's then going off at a segmental level to supply everything. What happens if that gets a bit toxic? The segmental arteries are at the level of the somites. I can't go into, into any more detail here because this is just a very brief synopsis, but you can actually treat target tissues and target organs osteopathically by changing the quality of the flow of the blood inside the artery and changing its, its flow into the target tissue. And it's an amazing feeling to feel vertebral segments melt under your hand when you're changing the flow of blood to those segments. Here we've got say, a typical vertebrae. Here's the aorta showing these segmental arteries coming off, going into the spinal cord, going into the disc, going into the joints, and the associated segmental muscles. Here's the venous return. So here we've got the vertebral bodies and the discs. This is a plexus of nerves called Batson plexus. It goes all the way up and down the spine from the, the dorsals right way down through to the sacrum. And there's no valves in this plexus. And it's even thought that this plexus is the mechanics by which primaries send secondaries which end up in the spine in terms of tumours. And this Batson's plexus going up and down inside the vertebral column is thought to be the reason for the spread of prostate cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, kidney cancers, thyroid cancer. All potentially being spread in that venous plexus in the spine. Got no valves. If we can improve the venous drainage from a tissue, particularly the spine, in this example, how much do you think that would improve the physiology of the vertebrae, the discs, our ligaments, facets, the segment musculature, all the things that you're dealing with in your patients almost every single point in time? Just thinking of the blood supply and the venous drainage to the tissues of the spine and musculoskeletal system. In terms of our older patients, what do you think is happening to that vasculature and the venous drainage? And what's the consequence of those changes? If that patient has had a sedentary lifestyle, but being like a sit-down osteopath, what's going to be the effect of that after many years of, of that sedentary lifestyle, exacerbating that poor circulation and venous return? This is a picture of the spinal cord itself showing the arterial supply into it and there's venous drainage away from it. What will happen if that arterial supply to the cord is not good? What's going to happen if you get venous stasis into that cord? You're going to get some cord neuropathy. You're going to get stasis, you're going to get toxicity, you're going to get congestion, edema, all within the cord. How's that going to affect the quality of that person's life, their symptom picture. If we look at pelvic venous congestion, this is a picture of the uterus, I'm showing it from a, a classical segmental uh, slide through view. 
and he can see the tortuosity of the veins from the uterus and the fallopian tubes. And see over in here also including the rectum. This one is a normal female pelvis, and this is a female pelvis showing venous congestion. And just look at the tortuosity and the swelling of those veins by comparison to this one. Can you see that from the back? Okay. Another picture, again, the veins in this diagram, congested and swollen, tortuous, and this is it on the venigram, showing the thickening of the veins in the pelvis. This is the kidneys. Another picture, this one, showing the varicosities in the veins. Sorry, can you see that at the back? It's a bit of an iffy picture, I'm afraid. But here you can see, can you see the tortuosity in these vessels here? Yes, no? Yeah, okay. And here you can see it in some of the bigger vessels here. Stasis. Yeah, going back to that kidney picture, the one on the right, is, is that the fallopian tubes that are in much it's been affected by the tortuosity. I grab this coming from the because it looks very different from the one on the left. Yeah. Well I just grabbed this picture because I was looking for an image with some venous congestion, so yeah. I haven't really thought about it. I mean obviously yeah. the the kidneys are not receiving the venous, but they're getting it um, directly from the, the the kidney the veins of the kidney. Mm -hmm. But um, if there's venous congestion here, then there's likely to be venous congestion elsewhere. That's, I, I can't say more than that way. Look at venous congestion in the legs. This is a normal one. This is a one with massive varicosities. And this is the familiar picture that we see in many elderly patients, that varicosity showing as a visible sign. And it's just a quick image showing varicosities either in the, the thigh or lower down. And what you've got to remember is that varicosities are just a sign of something much more profound happening somewhere else. You've got varicosities showing in the legs, you can guarantee what's going to be happening in terms of the varicosities and the internal congestion and tortuosity in the pelvis that you don't see. Yeah? The varicosity that you see is like the tip of the iceberg. So the varicosity can we'll call that venous congestion in the pelvis, and you may see it showing in the thigh. As we all know, it's very much more common in behind the knee and the lower the down in the leg. But so do when you see varicosities, think about the congestion and the tortuosity that you don't see. Treatment of venous congestion, which we're going to do in our workshop, becoming. You need to think about this word circulation. Circulation circle. If you shunt blood from A to B, well, what's the effect of it when it reaches B? It's going to have an effect somewhere else. So if you suddenly have a patient and you think, oh yeah, I really need to help this patient's venous return, there are a moment that what's going to happen to that venous return that you're suddenly increasing the volume. It's going to suddenly increase the volume up into the right atrium, the right ventricle, then there's a lot more work to do. It then pushes it into the lungs. Are the lungs able to handle that sudden increased whoosh if you increase the venous return from the pelvis and the lower extremities and the abdomen? So think before you suddenly treat venous return. Where's that blood going to go? And are the tissues that are going to receive that increased blood flow able to handle it? So, one of the best ways to treat venous return is to start with the lungs. So, think about the quality of the lung expression, the movement of the rib cage, the dorsals. Is that able to handle that increased sudden gush if you treat the pelvis? Okay. This is just to give some idea where the heart's lying and think about the <coughs> outflow 
of the pulmonary arteries into the lungs. And you can work through the rib cage, thoracic inlet, manubrium, you do the cranial approach, you can think about the lung tissue internally. But if you don't, even just mechanical work on the musculoskeletal approach to the thorax will help the lungs. Now, a very important osteopathic point that we don't treat skin and clothing. Well, I've never done it. We treat not where our hands are. We don't treat where our hands are. We treat where our attention is. You can put your hands on your thigh and you can feel the femur inside, but the femur's this far away. So you can put your hands here and you can think about the pulmonary arteries. You can think about the lung tissue, even though you're touching the ribs. And you'll have an effect, not where your hands are, but where you take your mind and your attention. So if you're coming to my workshop, you'll be needing to take your attention to various tissues, even if you didn't think you could do it before. Okay. So we're going to treat the lungs by working through the mechanical aspect of the thorax and if you use the involuntary approach, we can use that too. If you're thinking about blood vessels, the pipe work, as I said before, has a mechanical influence on the whole body. But if you treat the pipes, you're going to create powerful fascial pulls, possibly to tissues in a way that you didn't expect and in a way that may not be beneficial because you're going to be suddenly pulling on those arterioles and capillaries all over the body in many cases and can really distress the system in a way that would not be too clever. So it's better to think functionally, just think about can you help the blood flowing down those pipes? Think of function rather than the structure when you're doing this type of thing. Best not to treat the heart because the heart's very profound and if you don't get it right, the knock-on effect is not good in terms of you can be pulling and pulling, creating mechanical strains on all the major blood vessels throughout the whole body and it's best not to do it until you come on the course to learn more skill.